to this special event with the Ainu indigenous scholar, artist, dancer, Dr. Kanako Uzawa. This event is co-hosted by the Center for Japanese Research and the Museum of Anthropology at UBC and the David Land Center at Simon Fraser University. The Museum of Anthropology and all of UBC Vancouver is located in ancestral unceded territory of the Hunkleminum speaking Musqueam people. Since the founding of MOA in 1949, Musqueam has stepped forward and asked the museum to be self-critical, to consider our position as a colonial institution, and to work to create a different future for museums. This is ongoing work, and we acknowledge and thank Musqueam for their generosity. Around the world, there are thousands of indigenous nations who have and continue to endure colonization, and we all need to be engaged in recognizing and working to counteract these ongoing effects. So I'd just like to take everyone, ask everyone to take a moment to reflect on the resilience, <coughs> diversity, strength, and history of Indigenous peoples globally. I'm so happy to welcome Dr. Uzawa Tomoa tonight. During the height of the pandemic, as we were all locked down in our homes and teaching via Zoom, I had the great pleasure of attending her Zoom presentation, I Knew 150 Years of Resilience. So it's just so remarkable to think that a year and four months later, we're able to welcome you uh, physically to this building. Tonight, would, it's only possible due to the generous financial support of a number of institutions, and it's so great tonight to have Simon Fraser University and the University of British Columbia working together to bring this scholar here for this evening's event. So this event is co-sponsored by the David Lamb Center, the School for the Contemporary Arts, the Institute for Performance Studies, and the Global Asia Program, all at Simon Fraser University and at UBC, the Center for Japanese Research and the Department of Asian Studies. I'd now like to invite Dr. Fuyubi Nakamura, the co-organizer of this event, who is our curator at MOA for Asia and an assistant professor in Asian Studies to introduce the event and the speaker, Dr. Nakamura. And uh, good evening and welcome. Um, my work and relationship with Ainu, people and culture, go back many years ago. But here at UBC in 2019, I co-organized a special event entitled Hokkaido 150, Tetra Colonialism uh, in more and far and beyond to commemorate the 150th anniversary of Tetra colonization for Northern Ireland of Hokkaido known as Ainu Singh to Ainu people. Mm. We are through that time to welcome Ainu singers, Mayu Kiki and Tomo Yahata, who is also a curator at the National Ainu Museum, <laughs> and Haida singer, Terry William Davidson, to explore reconciliation through, through music. That event was followed by a workshop with Ainu and Ainu specialist scholars, including Dr. Mai Ishihara, a scholar with mixed eye English, and Dr. Anne Ellis Warren, now from University of Victoria, who is with us today. It was an opportunity to reflect on the history of settler colonialism 
and its impact on indigenous people while celebrating art, culture, and music of British Columbia and Hokkaido as we renew our commitment to international cooperation and truth and reconciliation. The event was co-hosted by the Center for Japanese Research and the Museum of Anthropology, and the Center for Japanese Research Director is Kiba Kim. There's different ways to pronounce his name. It's a research student. Thank you for joining us. And we also, and that event was main sponsor for the Hokkaido 150, it was the Consulate General of Japan in Vancouver. And we have pleasure of having Ms. Kayo Imamura and Mr. Ryosuke Nakazawa from Consulate Research this evening. Thank you for joining us. And one of the sponsors for the event was the SAQ Zeli Lab Center and uh, co host of tonight's events. And uh, Director Dr. Mike Hasselet is also with us. Thank you. Uh, in the follow-up event, I co-organized with Dr. Ayaka Yoshimizu from Asian Studies here at BBC, the Ainu, Okinawa, and Indigenity series hosted by the Center for Japanese Research last March. And Dr. Kazawa was one of the speaker for this online lecture series, as Sue just mentioned. And then SFU's Daily Lab Center also invited to Ainu scholars we have invited for their online lecture series later last year, Dr. Ishihara and Dr. Kazawa. So we have been communicating about mutual interest in this culture from Japan. So it's so great we are co-hosting this event today. And this time, we are so excited to have Dr. Uzawa with us in person. Thank you for coming all the way from Norway. <laughs> She's an Irish scholar, advocate, and artist and performer. She just participated in the Intercultural Indigenous Choreographer Creation Lab at Bank Center, where she actually did a fantastic dance performance. She also gave a talk at UBC for Canadian before arriving here on Monday. So she's been very busy for the past <laughs> two or four weeks. <laughs> and uh, she's a multilingual culture speaker uh, scholar who speaks Japanese, English, Norwegian, and then the Thailand. She obtained her doctorate from Arctic University of Norway in 2020 and lives still in Norway. She is a founder of Ayn today. She's currently involved with planning upcoming Ayn exhibition at the University of Michigan's Museum of Art, later. Her presentation this evening is entitled, as you see there, The Casting Eye Indigeneity in Museum Through Performing Arts. She will explore eye and performing arts <coughs> through discussion and performance as an important element of indigenous knowledge. Please join me in welcome Dr. Zhao. This is the Aina greeting. Iran Karate. Iran Karate. According to uh, Dr. Kaino Shigeru, who was uh, one of the last Aina uh, speakers, he, he, um, he translated as, let me touch your heart. Mm -hmm. So this is a little bit more than hello. <laughs> and, uh, thank you so much for uh, welcoming me and the co host organizer. This is it's a really uh, great honor to be here today and to meet all of you. And uh, it's very important for me to uh, connect myself and to my consciousness and your consciousness and then, then the land and nature around us. And uh, I can sing a song. And in this way, actually, I will relax more. <laughs> <laughs> so this um, I'm a song, it's a called Pirika. Uh, it's a lullaby. I, I sing a song for my children every night. I have two girls at, the, at home. And this is uh, about today is a beautiful day. Today is a beautiful day. There is a good girl. There is a good girl. Where is she? Suppose. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So I will give a short 
about 40 minutes presentation starting with uh, my personal story to my museum work. Um, I'm uh, currently involving as a guest creator for the Iron Art Exhibition uh, in collaboration with the uh, University of um, University of Michigan Museum of Art in the United States. And uh, I have worked um, in um, Cologne in Germany for another exhibition last year up to uh, February this year. Um, so start with introduction. Uh, then, then, sorry, and then I would um, play mouse harp. And then I would weave into some of my performances, including dance with new music. But uh, I am and, uh, one of my friends in the US, musician Michael, um, the actually student of Annalise graduate student. Uh, it's a contemporary music with um, pretty sound. And then dance, and then lastly, I would like to ask you all to sing together with me. So I hope you will join me. So I'm a, I'm a scholar, and it, it's a long story, but I have never thought of um, this is a painting by my daughter, by the way, and I thought that was very beautiful because it's a mixed color. And um, she lives in all the cultural environment. And uh, Japanese, uh, she listened to Ainu song, she listened to my mouse herb, she listened to me talking about Ainu things. But she was born in Norway, and she has a Swedish father, and <laughs> they speak Swedish, they talk to me in Japanese, and we talk English, and so it's kind of, for me, that representation of multiculturalism. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, my name, Kanako, actually uh, in country, Kana um, means uh, uh, love, or, and Ko means a child, so I'm a child of my parents, that's how I interpret. And my grandfather was a political activist, so he made uh, me, uh, in my interpretation, he, he was hoping to, he was hoping that I would bridge between North and South. Mm. That's my interpretation, and I like it. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I never thought of becoming a scholar or anything. Um, I wasn't a big fan of uh, books or mm -hmm. I was more, I, I enjoy physical uh, movement. So uh, when I was younger, a university student in Tokyo, I started working at the Aino restaurant where I learned Aino um, cuisine and some plants. And, and so I became part of Aino community in Tokyo, actually. There's a community in Tokyo as well. And they had performance, uh, performing uh, group, performing arts group. So I became part of that. That's how I learned dance and so on. Um, but later on, I realized that by participating in international conferences and talk, uh, often a story of Ainu are told by non-indigenous, non-Ainu persons and scholars, often male. And I was in the audience listening, hmm, I can do better. <laughs> 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 it felt very strange that somebody else talking about my culture mm -hmm. and it didn't signal the same message and, and this <laughs> it felt very strange that somebody else talking about my culture mm -hmm. and it didn't signal the same message and, and this emotional attachments that we could have so I said hmm, how can I go to you know change the space and how can I come and stand this space to talk about my culture so one of a uh, way uh, is to, of course, to receive higher education so that I get the like, opportunity I'm like here. So I'm very grateful that uh, it was very hard as for me to um, uh, travel all the way to Norway and receive higher education all along. I was only Asian person in my department mm -hmm. or even faculty. So Asian study was not a big part of the, the university at all. So um, I have to kind of raise the voice and I want to do that Ainu studies, and nobody knew about uh, Ainu. They know, oh yeah, yeah, Japan, sushi, and onsen, <laughs> and uh, culture. So when I finished, I was so happy, and then, you know, started to uh, uh, receive more requests. So here I am, and I do, uh, 
is a dancer, artist, um, and I'm a mother. And I do arts because um, I think through art we can reach out wider audience. Um, it's you know you can open up more dialogue in informal way. And I, I like to talk to children. I like to talk to elders. So it's um, uh, used that as a tool to communicate with wider audience. So my mother, my father is actually Japanese. So this is a uh, map of Nibutani, where my mother comes from. It's a very small community, 400 um, people living in and around. And maybe some of you have even been to Nibutani, have you? Yeah, okay, wonderful. Um, it's a very small community, but uh, uh, culturally it's very rich. They still speak, um, they actually uh, started to have Ainu language class for um, public school. And uh, not so many hours, but nevertheless, it's very good positive. They have private Ainu language class, and a very uh, culturally rich and active community. So I was exposed, even though I was living in Tokyo, because my mother had a job. My mother is from this community. Even though my mother had a job, I was uh, spending time with my grandparents and cousin here in Nibutani, so I was exposed to Ainu culture, language, dance, and so it was just part of me, but I never thought I was so important to learn um, when I grew up because nobody told me, oh, this is very important because I think in my mother's generation, grandparents' generation, uh, they received lots of uh, discrimination. It's the same story here, I'm sure, and uh, it was not so encouraged. Um, but, um, I would come back to that. But this is a picture of my mother's family from the taking beginning of the 20th century. Uh, the mom uh, in the front, for you is right. It's Uesana, she, he, he was a sculptor, and he was, I heard he was pretty good at it. So um, uh, I will show you some of his work in the next slide. And uh, Monum Fano, so he's my, uh, the great, Great grandfather, and uh, he uh, Monopano has a tattoo. Maybe you have seen it in the, some of the pictures of Ainu in the past. But this is a <clears throat> yeah. Uh, we say a mature maturity of women uh, when you become uh, when you are um, about to marry. But you gonna you start actually tattooing early age, teenage, around fifty, around that slowly. Do that. But it was also prohibited um, by the government in the late 20th century. So this is uh, a work by Uesanashi. Mm -hmm. It's uh, over 100 years old. And we still use them um, at home. It's not, I don't hold this, possess this, but uh, my uncle, aunt, they have it. And they took a picture and sent them to me. You know, you can see how old it is. And it's just, it's very emotional for me to see. It. And when I, when I uh, uh, see the art, artifacts or objects, and I just learned from Phoebe, Phoebe some today that actually at the more you see belongings, and that's one wonderful way of mm -hmm. describing it. And I, I feel very uh, sad when I, whenever I see the uh, belongings and showcase in the museum. But this is still in your hand. So everybody has uh, somebody who inspires us, right? So that was my grandfather, Tadashi Kaizawa. He was a political activist. And uh, he, was, uh, he devoted him his life for uh, political movement, environment. So he, started to, he was a farmer, but he was also a political uh, activist. And, um, a uh, member of an association, Hokkaido, in Sapporo. And uh, he wrote uh, some of the, he did some writing, even though he didn't receive education. Mm -hmm. And that was uh, one of the reasons um, I could receive education, because he was always encouraging me to get higher education, to, you know, to be able to stand uh, equal platform as Japanese. You must receive higher education, especially when you're a woman. So he saved the money for me, and um, after he unfortunately passed away, when I was uh, around 12, 20, uh, I 
receive the, the saving and, and I use it as a part of my education. I did a, a BA in the United States, so I use that for my education and I'm so grateful that I had the opportunity. And uh, uh, he also taught me how to be proud of who we are and never give up. So, so this always like, keeps coming back when I have uh, challenges in, in my life. And he was also one of, uh, um, uh, he wasn't a plaintiff, but he was uh, uh, one of the activists who was against dam construction. Who, um, that dam is now built and completed in 1997 and became a, a big court case because uh, uh, Dr. Shigeru Kayano and actually my uncle sued the government and we won the case and that was the very first court case. And uh, then after that, uh, the court recognized Ainu as a minor ethnic minority groups and indigenous uh, indigenous to the language. Mm -hmm. So this became a, a big case and, and drew international attention. And people started, oh, what, what does that indigeneity or indigenous actually mean? So that was a very important case. So who are Ainu? Maybe many of you already know, but means uh, I know means human beings. Uh, we traditionally lived in Hokkaido, uh, Kilim Island, Sah uh, Southern Sahalin, and some of the uh, Northern Honshu. And traditionally, we practice hunting. We hunted deer and bear sometimes. We used the bear for ritual. And uh, fishing, salmon is our uh, staple food. And uh, now uh, we have limited uh, fishing rights, so there are fishing rights uh, court case going on at the moment. But um, we use uh, salmon, for example. You, you, the philosophy is that we have to use all parts to show the respect to the growth of salmon. We believe in aminism, so that means that. We use the head and bones to make a, a bouillon in the soup. So you boil it at a low temperature for a couple of days and to make a soup, a little salt, and lots of vegetables. It's called kohau. And we used to take the skin and make the shoes out of that. And so for and foraging wild plants is still practiced in the community. So in spring comes, this is like a very popular activity for a, a female or woman in the community and we go to the mountain and this is also a wonderful opportunity for intergenerational uh, learning space. And then we have medicinal plants still um, and we have a plant, wild plants called shitopino, which is like a, a sample, uh, tastes like a garlic. So, Locals say, don't go, don't eat the uh, chitopiro before the date. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, okay. Um, but this chitopiro also has other, other side because because it smells, the next day everybody can smell, oh, you have eaten chitopiro because chitopiro was considered as iron plant. Mm -hmm. So this kind of triggered discrimination. Mm -hmm. So, you know, lots to say about this plant, chitopiro. Mm -hmm. And the end of the uh, um, 20th century to the 21st century, you know, the idol well, also uh, became a victim of, uh, or became fascinating research object. Some of the scholars uh, believe that we, have, we are related to application because of the physical difference to the Japanese, and they became very fascinated. After Edo era, when the um, Sakoku uh, uh, period, isolation of foreign policy open. There are many foreigners came, missionaries, and, and you know, it was possible to go in and out of the, of the country. So uh, that ended, um, resulted in uh, unethical digging and stealing of Ainu human remains. Uh, which was over, this is the uh, information from 2019, but that time was uh, 1,574 and human remains are stored in 12 universities throughout the country. And, and now we have Ukopoi, which is uh, a new national museum of Ainu. 
a built memorial facility, they house is human over 1,323. And some of them are not possible to be identified, so therefore we cannot recuperate. So I just want to um, mention that uh, because I knew or became a very fascinating object in a museum setting, I knew participated in those uh, events, Human Pavilion in Osaka, 1903, 1904, Louisiana Purchase Exhibition, 1990, Japan British Exhibition in London. So um, this was, as you all know, uh, was a part of, uh, it was used as a justification of colonialism and known as human zoo. So when I was trying to study about this, I crossed this article written by uh, uh, Dr. Zilme, a student of actually analyst. <laughs> um, and and uh, this is a state my statement by the Fushine Koso Ekashi. Ekashi means the uh, old uh, uh, respected elderly man. So he was very fluent in both languages, which was great at that time. And he went to Osaka, and but he couldn't. He couldn't. He was teaching Ainu language culture to his to the children in the community, but he couldn't read. Mm. So that meant that when he went to Osaka, he he uh, mistakenly taken uh, police office for udon shop or something like that. <laughs> so that was like, uh, he was pointing out in this article that, you know, how difficult it is for the Aino. You know, if you can't read, it's very difficult to even navigate yourself in the Japanese society. So, I'm just going to read this. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm Aino called Fushine Yastaro. Uh, he changed the name. The reason why I'm here in Osaka this time is to appeal to you for a helping hand in fulfilling my hopes. I can say that being Ainu, we feel that we're Japanese. At this very moment, we Ainu can now appear for cons conscription examination and loyalty serve His Majesty Emperor. It's sad, however, that we cannot become decent soldiers because we Ainu do not have education. It has been my goal for many years to strive, however, I can to enhance Ainu education. So he, it's interesting, he identified himself both Japanese and Ainu. And this is and emphasizing the importance of education. That leads to my connection to my grandfather. So this is kind of, for me, it's very, I get emotional when I read this because this is a continuation of um, activism from the past to the present. And this is, by the way, the Ainu house system. This is how it looks like inside. So exhibition in Cologne um, at the uh, Lautensch, uh, it's, very, it's a long and difficult name to pronounce, but I try my best. Lautensch, Lauten, do you have a German person? <laughs> Lautenstrauch Jost Museum, Culture of the World. So I was um, contacted by, uh, by uh, creators, uh, Walter and Annabelle, uh, last year. And, and they were working on an exhibition in collaboration with Super Boy Museum. And, but they wanted, really wanted to, because they had so many artifacts. 280, and that's a lot. So, but they quickly realized that, you know, instead of just displaying those objects, they should include an artist. So, but how can they do that? And they should, uh, you know, if possible, they wanted to work with an artist, so they were trying to, uh, they did the research to try to reach out to the old an contemporary artist, and I was one of them. I was a very honor to be invited to open the exhibition. And these are uh, main collection uh, collected by a um, uh, Polish photographer, Peter Stuski. He had 80 historical photographs. And he went to, uh, I think, Sahanin, and then 
he actually married an Ainu uh, lady who was a daughter of the chief in that village because she was teaching him Ainu language. So it wasn't only that he was a photographer ethnologist, but he, he became very involved in the community. And other objects were collected by this German um, ethnographer and world traveler, Joost and Uma. So those are, oh, it's not here. But for example, those are, for example, those uh, youth, uh, these, they live in Nibutani. And one of them actually, uh, Mancha has, um, she took uh, the YouTube channel called Shito Channel, which is a three minutes short uh, YouTube channel that introduces how to learn Ainu language. It has been very popular. Um, and I have, by the way, my own website which lists all the Ainu related contemporary literature, not like old one, but contemporary, both English and Japanese. It's called Ainu Today. And uh, I'm using a channel as well. Okikano is a very famous Ainu musician. Um, play Tonkori, and I, I don't know if he has been to Baku, but maybe not yet. And myself, yes. So I uh, I made this dance video, and they ask um, if they can uh, commission the work. So it was displayed at the uh, part of the um, exhibition. And going back to uh, human remains, in 2016 there was a um, an event in Japan that some of 12 12. Uh, I mean, you might remain, I think, and now even more, we returned to the community, and it was very emotional for the Ainu community because that was the second time that we received um, Ainu human remains. So that kind of triggered the discussion of human remains overseas as well. So they, they did some research, and they found actually that there are 17 Ainu bodies held in Germany. So I knew about this case, so I, uh, I uh, brought this discussion to the museum and asked, can we uh, talk about this in the exhibition as a part of our... Uh, yes, yes, that's a good idea. So I made a short film uh, talking about, about this um, the event. So 2017, one of the uh, body uh, was returned to the representative of the Ainu Association of Hokkaido and Japanese government from German academic society. And it was, it was um, found out that it was stolen by German tourists in Sapporo in 1879. So this exhibition was very unique in the European context. Maybe in Canada, I know that more is very progressive in this way, but uh, it was very unique because they actively uh, involved uh, Ainu inviting me and uh, allowed me to open the exhibition. So I made a point that in the ex op uh, opening of the exhibition, I said this is very emotional for me because over 100 years ago, Ainu was exhibit exhibited as a living object. But now here I'm standing and I have a voice and education. So this was very uh, uh, important moment for me. Uh, this is a website that uh, if any of you are interested in Ainu, contemporary Ainu, I must say. Thank you, Yorakire. And now I will move on to uh, performing art. Uh, so I play this. 
So it used to be used for expressing ourselves, feelings, right, to, uh, for loved one or family members, kind of a old letter or <laughs> communication tool. Mm -hmm. So I, uh, for the next sound, I close my throat, open, close, so it's kind of throat singing in a way. And you can, uh, I, make, I will also make a sound of air.
sure. Maybe frog that they do on. Oh, yes, something mm -hmm. small, yes. Mm -hmm. But no. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <Yeah. laughs>
this is a, actually I forgot to mention before, but it is about um, how human comes into the forest. As we are coming to the forest, we always pray, uh, let the nature, mountain, and uh, all animal let them know that, okay, I'm here, I'm coming in, please protect us. So what I did now is a narrative of human me coming into the forest, and then they see the beautiful butterflies. And then I wanted to catch, and I catch it. But he wanted to fly away, so I let him do that. And then I transform into grasshopper. And then on the way, I did the laundry, <laughs> so I have to dry, so I did the birds, and then birds, and then in the end, feeling of the wind, so that's the last movement, as you know, the leaf of the trees. So this is a dance, thank you very much, and I have a, a gift for all of you today which is the uh, I'm songs that you, you will remember <laughs> and, and sing together. <laughs> so, this is uh, Asahika Rock Upopo. This is a call and a response Upopo from Asahika region, northwest central Hokkaido. And uh, Upopo is usually very long, but to uh, just kind to you all, I made sure. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know, have you ever done Ukuku? Maybe. Analyst. So she can lead you all. <laughs> <laughs> so it goes like this, I just sing a couple times. Hausa, hao, hoya, hao, hao, hao. So please let's sing together a few times. And after that I will divide into three groups. <laughs> so okay. Five, six, seven, eight. Hausa, hallo, hoya, hallo, hallo, hausa, hallo, hoya, hallo, hallo, ashpeparun kanui mawe, kantori wa pidori wa ashpeparun. Start house up, 
then you go Hausa. And you go Hausa. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Shall we try? Yes. Maybe we, we sing one more time all together. And then you go one step. So again, five, six, seven, eight. Hausa. together with, with Kanako-san, um, my dear friend, whom I uh, I just have to say very briefly that um, I am able to um, have learned uh, the very important lessons of how to be respectful and to be a guest in Ainu Moshiri, uh, some people call it Yao Moshiri, because of Kanako. She's really been my guide and my dear friend, <laughs> sorry, uh, for more than 20 years since I was a little grasshopper myself. So, <laughs> so um, and, and as you can see, she's now a teacher to my own students, so I'm hugely grateful to her. Um, it's a great honor, but this is really about you and a chance for you to ask questions that you might have for her. Um, she's lived quite an incredible multicultural life, as you can see, but the thing that's incredible is that she's grounded um, in the teachings and in the, um, the knowledge and the relationship with the land of her grandparents and her parents and her aunts and uncles and she has she has really this sort of uh, incredible uh, Ainu family and uh, we can learn so much from all of them so this is an opportunity for each of you uh, to ask questions if you may so we'll open up the floor now. Good afternoon and Agato for sharing um, some of your culture. I, I am not a Japanese speaker I try to learn but I am curious because you said um, you know with uh, your forebears that education is very important. And I was wondering, um, does Ainu have written language? And has that been a challenge if it isn't, if it's more just an oral tradition? So how, how do you um, do it justice in terms of trying to capture the cadence or the sounds if you have to adapt Japanese as I saw the lyrics? Thank you for a uh, very important question. So we, uh, we traditionally uh, our language, we, uh, we don't have written language, so it's oral. So that meant that we have fantastic memory capacity. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, my aunt, aunt used to say, you know, they used to remember the name of our relatives, name of the people that goes back to 120 years or 120 years. And then, ironically, 
those written documents and reports uh, by missionary and researcher that has been done over 100 years ago have been, uh, become very important resource to revitalize the language. So it's a, it's a bit uh, ironical situation, but um, that's, uh, it has been very helpful to revitalize. And now it's even more. Uh, a younger generation are aware of Ainu culture and migration identity. So more news are coming up. And uh, what I'm doing now is, uh, is um, because when I finished the PhD, I felt like, OK, now I can make my own past as an independent, independent person, as a woman, and uh, raise awareness, not to be afraid of being a past. Um, you know, if you don't have PhD, maybe people may criticize you for your knowledge. So, so I, we hope that more uh, youth will come out and feel more comfortable uh, with who they are and their own expression. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to know what was the biggest obstacle to the repatriation of Ainu bodies? Because it, because in your slides you mentioned that there was only uh, there were seven I mean, uh, I mean bodies within Germany and only one was repatriated. So what is the biggest obstacle to getting the rest returned back to the uh, their own people? So obstacle was was. Uh, it has to be um, uh, proven that it was stolen. Mm -hmm. So, so some of them don't have a record on it, or name, so which community they come from. So it was that was the reason why only one of them was returned. And it's the same with the human remains that have been held at the Boy Museum. Some of them can't find out where they come from, which family they belong to. Yeah, I just uh, related to that. I actually am curious uh, how you think about to repatriate actual artifacts, not human remains, uh, because you saw lots of uh, things actually in uh, Germany too. And do you think that uh, they should, those artifacts should be also returned to either uh, or Hokkaido? Yes, uh, uh, definitely. But uh, and uh, especially like this museum, Nordisch Jost Museum, had very uh, rare findings that we don't see anymore in Japan, and but they're just lying there in the storage room. And um, I'm trying to work with those. So my next project is to to look into those artifacts, trying to find the narratives, backstory, and why it was collected, and, but uh, make it more like artistic. So next project with the Italian photographer is to make a video art. So I put some narratives, do some research on certain objects, and uh, use it for the educational purposes or uh, exhibition display and as an installation. And, uh, but also I saw that it is also important to have the object to tell the story that what had happened. So that's my stance. Thank you. Um, hi. Um, so thank you so much for being here and also for sharing with us your experience today. I'm curious about the discourse on Ainu people in current Japan. So you also mentioned like how the elderly um, I do um, talks about his own experience at the turn of the century, so I am really interested to know more about like the shift and what compelled the shift and what yeah. what? Like, uh, is there any like paradigm shift in the discourse on Ainu people in Japan mm -hmm. over the years and what compels the changes? Um, it's a long story, but. Uh it's uh, because, you know, Ainu are first time recognized as an indigenous 2008 by the government. And after that, it's, it's uh, increasingly, you know, now we have National Museum. And before, uh, when I grew up, it was, not, or even my mother, like, why do you want to do this? Uh, and uh, my grandparents also, uh, except my grandfather or uncle were engaged in the political movement. They question, why are you doing this? 
what's the point, right? And, and I'm sure it's very common here too in the generation. And, but now it's very changing because they uh, find it uh, more use of finding it, it's actually learning a new language and finding their own way of expressing is very joyful and a very powerful tool. So they're engaging in the uh, cultural uh, culture and the language revitalization movement, learning the dance and songs. So I have great hope. And uh, and media has and media, social media, and newspaper, radio, all of that have been taking up lots of uh, Aino cultural uh, subjects. So it has been a lot discussed. So, but the point is that you know who is has the power to control that all of that. You know, are we participating as a, a, a main player in that representation of the of the discourse or not? Did I answer your question? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Kanako-san. That was amazing, and uh, you transport all of us into uh, into the culture of the Ainu. So thank you. Um, I had two questions, um, very different. Uh, do you know anything about what's happening on the Russia side uh, with the Kurils and Sahalin? And uh, I, I had a student last year from Russia, and, and he said he was involved in engagement with the indigenous people in, in the Kuril Islands. So there seemed to be something. But and is there any connection? at all that are being remade between the Ainus in Hokkaido and the Ainus in Kuril and Sakhalin. Mm -hmm. uh, and my second question, maybe simpler, is given that the Ainus were fishing a lot and, and they were all over the archipelago, where all the island, Kuril Islands, etc., there must be a deep connection to the ocean. And so we, how is the ocean and, and the big animals like the whales, orcas, etc., represented in Ainu culture? Uh, was there canoe building as well, etc., in the culture? Yes, mm. uh, the uh, first question is that uh, it's actually uh, when I was a uh, university student, there was culture exchange between Ainu, Hokkaido Ainu, and I think it was Sahalin, not a clip. I, I'm not, I don't remember. I think Sahalin, there was an organization, so there was a, some exchange. I couldn't, I couldn't go for some reason that time. And there was some, one or two who identified themselves as still Ainu in Sahalin, and I saw the newspaper article about that as well. Um, but other than that, I don't really know. It's, it's very rare, and yeah very limited information about them, unfortunately. The second question, yes, there are, I don't know about the, those uh, big wells and, and seals. I know that it was used as a trading with the Japanese, but also uh, uh, canoe was a very important um, tool to, of course, to go uh, for the transportation. Uh, when they didn't have, when we didn't have a, a, a road, and the canoe um, making is still in practice for more like a ritual, like to remember our culture. So August 20 in this Nintani community, we have um, had a festival. What was the name? Chibasanke. Ah, Chibasanke. So this is uh, revitalized by uh, Dr. Shigeru Kayano and uh, to remember the kind of making and the connection to the river, uh, that Sal river that we had. And uh, by the way, I came to uh, uh, British Columbia and Alak Bay uh, when I was a uh, child together with uh, Dr. Uh, Shigeru Kayano. I was part of Iron language class, even though I was not actually, yeah, because he, he and uh, my grandparents are friends, so they asked if I could join. And then I met uh, Gloria Webster, and she welcomed us in um, the Bay Kawak. And then I saw how proud the youth were. They spoke their language, their dance, and it was very uh, strong memory for me. So I have the connection, the emotional connection to Colombia. So for that reason, I'm also grateful that I could reach out. Um, the, someone had already asked my question, but then it made me think about you personally. And I think I just, I want to raise my hands to you. 
and for all you carry, and for what you hold in your heart. I have, um, my husband is from Hokkaido. Um, we go to Japan and we go to his home. And for the, over the last 18 years, we've seen quite a difference in the respect and honor of the people. And um, it, it makes me feel I'm Kosevish. My people are from Stanemach. And I, I grew up not knowing where I was from, but what I hear in your voice is what I hear in my heart. And uh, so I, I know uh, is that you, you feel called. Or I hear, I feel called, and I'm curious <laughs> about your, um, your resilience and your, how you are here on this. This is how you were able to look at the people and say, I could do that better. <laughs> and then, <laughs> and what, what, um, perhaps you could just speak a little bit about that. But before, I just also, um, yeah, I just want to raise my hands to you. And I feel a lot of similarities between Coast Salish culture and your culture. Uh, so it's, it's so beautiful to hear you and, and be here with you. You said that I feel something. I didn't. I didn't hear what you said. You feel something came. Home? Oh, call. Call. Calling. Calling. Oh, like I see. Yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Oh, oh, how nice. Thank you for beautiful words. Um, yeah, I think it's uh, like I wouldn't have been here if I didn't meet all these people, including you all and the people who brought me here today. Like you, Sam, and you, and everybody, and also all this um, support that I got from elders. And now, when I came to Banff, there are elders, um, uh, indigenous elders from uh, Calgary or different parts, they are faculty members. And they say, you know, listening is as important as uh, talking. So, we all learn how to listen. And that that's, has been always my uh, motto, to listen carefully, uh, be patient. And it takes a long time, in which it took a long time for me to feel confident and be proud. And I see um, some of my friends are very uh, bullied at school or in the marriage, um, was rejected by um, the partner's parents or, you know, all these things, very negative thing, alcoholism. Not so much drug though. So, but then I feel like we could, you know, what can I do? You know, how can I contribute to this process of cultural revitalization, but mostly in you know, how we can be proudly of who, who we are. So one of the ways is to bring in positive aspects of the culture and language, which for me is performing art, because I love dancing and singing and all that, because then I can reach out wider audience, and we can all enjoy. So thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, I was wondering, is your website and the work you do is was contemporary? Um, I'm wondering what it is that you really hope that your own children and other I youth can learn um, from seeing you dance and all this other contemporary I youth um, representation on your website. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, uh, it, it's uh, you know, that uh, there is a freedom and the uh, opportunity if you want to. And uh, we are here to support them and to be afraid. And, and that's very important because they are all very unique in their own way. And they're always a way uh, to express if there is a possibility, if the opportunity is given, and we should all support that. So by uh, promoting Ainu culture through my website, like I get uh, questions, different requests all over the world. Surprisingly, there are many. And I'm very happy that I did it because otherwise I wouldn't have known. Mm -hmm. And through that, I reconnected to so many people who are interested in Ainu culture. And uh, amazing, you know, how many people are interested. You know, so a small group of people of Japan, indigenous people of Japan. So. Thank you. Check, check. Okay. Um, thank you for everything you've 
shared. Um, my name is Michelle Laflamme, and um, I'm an associate professor. I went to school here, and I was the first person in my family to do doctoral work. So I appreciate that you had your grandpa up there, and that you recognize the important path that you have made. Um, and I just wanted to uh, share a teaching with you um, that is probably part of what is motivating you and that was shared with me. And that is the idea that the decisions that we make today, uh, we consider the last seven generations and the next seven coming. And I think you're doing um, very, very important work. And always remember to honor your, your grandfather for the inspiration he gave you. So thank you for starting with that and bringing that into a part of what you shared today. I really appreciate that. Thanks. Want to do the same for the youth, so hopefully more youth um, would take it as inspiration or motivation, so I can pass it on. Then, so thank you so much. What, what is the recognition of the government of Japan nowadays, and what are they doing to um, to incorporate and to in, to be more inclusive towards? So the, rec the recognition of government of Japan towards Ainu, the yeah. Ainu community, okay. <laughs> is the question. Mm. So we have a new law now, Ainu new law, um, uh, enacted in uh, 2019, and that's, but uh, those, we had a previous law which always only promoted the cultural aspect of it, but still continues, and there was a protest against it because, you know, cultural Promotion is one thing, but to give us freedom as self-determination and uh, rights to exercise the culture and also develop is also important. That part is not given to us yet. That's why the fishing rights is limited. We can only get the salmon to the amount that we need for the ceremony, which is like a ten. Um, then that's that's not enough. If it is staple food, just like a bread for uh, some people, you know, it should be given. And so they, su they, they support uh, within their framework, but it's very far away from our need. They may support financially, and they, like uh, National um, Museum of Boy, for example, included Ainu uh, creators uh, in the process. So, but I don't know a detail about it, how much they're actually involved, how much uh, power they have in the decision-making process. That's the most important part when it comes to uh, self-determination. Mm -hmm. And so this is a question, but also like the discussion of indigenous rights, self-determination, and etc. are also very new, newly introduced in Japan. Um, so that is the discussion that we have to take up. My name is Hukla and I'm of the Shumakmik Nation and the Silks Nation from the interior of British Columbia. And I live on these lands of my Coast Salish cousins. I honor your bravery. Thank you so much for sharing. Because we share the same kind of things, the hatred, the horrible life conditions that our polite Canadians don't like to talk about. <laughs> so, um, and I'm always the one that brings up the hard stuff. You know, so I just want to say I honor you. We stand in solidarity with you. My family brings greetings to your family way over there across the world. Cooks Jan, Cooks Jan, Cooks Jan. Mm -hmm. えっと、<笑>
。で、彼女はあのアイドルの踊りも紹介してました。それで、えっ、ー、と、そういう、なんていうんですか、コレオグラフとかの、もざ、あの、舞台とかも。いろいろ教えていて、私はそのクラスを取ってたんですけども。うん、だから、えー、と須藤先生は。<笑>あの、国からの、あの。金が出て少しですけどもそれであのそういう、えー、と歌とかの,そのなんていうんですかメロディーとかもちゃんとあの楽譜にしてあのしてらしたんですけどもねそういうのをもしご,ご存知だったらもう私はあの、ね、こちらに来てから20年経ってるので須藤先生がどうしてらっしゃるのかちょっと分かんないんですけどもあのもしご存知でしたらそういうコネクションを作られたら。すごくあのいやあなたのためにもなると思いますし、そういう楽譜もあるし、それからあの実際にすごい簡単な踊りですけども、あの私たちも習いますのでできると思います。うんうんジョイ
that mm -hmm. is part of um, what it is that you do, and that this has become an important place uh, for you since you were since you were young and connecting with language revitalization here, and now that. Uh, you know, the Ainu have played such a critical role in these kind of trans-Pacific and global connections um, themselves. So this is kind of going full circle in all these ways. I have um, a small gift for you, and I guess you've probably seen this um, this book, but it is uh, first uh, first peoples and first fish, and it is about the beautiful art, and it has um, some essays by. Uh, Kana Shigeru, who you travel with, and so it's about the, I think, of the connections uh, to the, of the Pacific through the salmon, and also people of salmon, and, and the connections that keep going. It's just a, a joy to have you here to share with us. Thank you so Thank you. much. Thank you so much for coming. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you so much.